Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Lee. I teach systematic theology at CGST here. It's my uh, great privilege to introduce uh, our honored uh, speaker, uh, Professor Jungen Mugman, tonight. Uh, actually, Professor um, Jungen Mugman uh, does not need an introduction. Um, he has long been distinguished uh, as one of the most acclaimed theologians of our time since uh, the uh, publication of his celebrated Theology of Hope in 1964. He is the architect of post-Auschwitz theology as well as a pioneering voice in political theology, ecological theology, feminist and Jewish-Christian dialogue. He demonstrates a life that has dedicated itself to seeking a Christian response to the turmoil and opportunities of, of our time. His publication list is breathtaking in length, and many of his books are immensely influential. So, just name a few. The Crucified God in 1974, the Church in the Power of, of the Holy Spirit, 1977, the Trinity and the Kingdom of God in 1981, God in Creation in 1985, the Way of Jesus Christ in 1990, the Spirit of Life in 1992, the Coming of God in 1996, Experiences in Theology in 1999, Ethics of Hope, 2010. Professor Mugman truly has great delight and vitality in writing. We've been told that he's going to publish a new book uh, on Christian patience this year. So in uh, his profound theological works, there has been a great passion for life. This reminds me of a beautiful prayer I have read in Professor Mottmann's uh, autobiography. Uh, it serves a quotation here, quote, when I love God, I love the beauty of bodies, the rhythm of movements, the shining of eyes, the embraces, the feelings, the sense, the sounds of all this protean creation. When I love you, my God, I want to embrace it all, for I love you with all my senses in the creations of your love. In all the things that encounter me, you are waiting for me. The experience of God deepens the experiences of life. It does not reduce them, for they have raised the unconditional yes to life. The more I love God, the more gladly I exist. The more immediately and wholly I exist, the more I sense the living God, the inexhaustible source of life and eternal livingness." End quote. Such a great passion for life is why we are so thankful to have him in our midst tonight and to listen to his insights on the topic a culture of life in the dangers of our time. So please join me and offer a warm welcome to Professor Jürgen Mokma. Thank you, Professor Daniel Lee, for your kind words of introduction and of welcome. In this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I grapple with what have been my most urgent concerns for some time, a culture of life stronger than the terror of death, a love for life that overcomes the destructive forces in our world 
today and the confidence in the future that overcomes anxiety and fatalism. These issues are for me most urgent because with a poet Friedrich Hölderlin a belief strongly vor aber Gefahr ist, wächst das Rettende auch. But where there is danger, salvation also grows. We should inquire whether it to what extent this hope bears weight as we explore the possibilities of a culture of life in the face of the real annihilations with which our world is threatened. I will begin by addressing some of the dangers of our in part one. And in part two, offer some answers by considering dimensions of the world capable of supporting life and in a quite literal sense, a world that is worth of our love. And in the end, I return to the first verse of the poem by Hölderlin. Is God but difficult to grasp? Part one, the terror of universal death. Number one, life is today in danger. It is not in danger because it is a model. Human life has always been mortal. It is in danger because it is no longer loved in respected and affirmed and accepted. The French author Albert Camus wrote after World War II, this is a mystery of Europe. Life is no longer loved. The 20th century was a century of mass exterminations and mass executions, state terror from above. The beginning of the 20th, 21st century saw private terror from below of senseless killings with suicide assassins. In the terrorist of the 21st century, a new religion of death is confronting us. Do, I do not mean the religion of Islam, but rather the ideology of terror. Your young people love life, said the late Mullah Omar of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Our young people love death. After the mass murder in Madrid on March 11, 2004, there were acknowledgments by the terrorist with the same message. You love life, we love death. A German who joined the Taliban in Afghanistan declared, we don't want to win. We want to kill and be killed. 
Why? I think because they view killing as power and they experience themselves as gods of us. And they love publicity and this they get. This seems to be the modern terrorist ideology of suicide assassins. I remember we had this love of death in Europe some uh, 70 or 80 years ago. Viva la muerte, cried an old fascist general in the Spanish Civil War. Long live death and the German SS troops in the Second World War had the saying, death gives and death takes away. In war, the symbol of the skull and the bones. It is not possible to deter suicide assassins, for they have broken the fear of death. They don't love life anymore. They want to die with their victims. Second, behind the terrorist ideological surface, a great, greater danger is hidden. Peace disarmament and non-proliferation treaties between the nations share an obvious assumption, namely that on both sides there is a will to survive and the will to live. Yet what happens if one partner does not want to survive but is willing to die is through death that partner can destroy this whole wicked or godless world. Until now we have had to deal only with an international network of suicide assassins overcome by a death wish. What happens when a nation possessing nuclear weapons becomes obsessed with this religion of death? and turns into a collective suicide assassin against the rest of the human world because it is driven into a corner and gives up all hope. Deterrence works only so long as all partners have the will to live and want to survive when it is of no matter whether one lives or dies, one has lost the fear that is necessary for deterrence. Whoever is convinced for ideological or religious reasons that he or she must become a sacrifice in order to save the world can no longer be threatened with death. The one who clamors for the great war or the end war 
even if it is means one's own destruction is beyond deterrence. The attraction of destroying a world that is considered rotten and or disordered or godless can obviously grow into universal death wish to which one sacrifices one's own life. Death then becomes this fascinating divinity inflaming a desire for destruction. This apocalyptic religion of this is a real enemy of the will to live the love of life and the affirmation of being. Number three, a suicide program behind this present political danger endangering the common life of the nations is, there is still an older threat lurking the nuclear threat the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August 1945 brought the World War II to an end. At the same time is marked the beginning of the end time for the whole of humankind. The end time is in the age in which the end of humankind is possible at any moment. No human being could survive the nuclear winter that would follow a great atomic war. Remember, humankind was at the cusp of such a great atomic war for more than 40 years during the Cold War time. It is true that since the end of the Cold War in 1990, the great atomic war is not as likely. We live in relative peace. Yet there are so many atomic and hydrogen bombs stored up in the arsenals of the great nations and some smaller ones as well that the self-annihilation of humankind remains a distinct possibility. The Russian atomic scientist Zakharov called it collective suicide of humankind. Whoever fires first dies second. For those 40 years, we depended on mutually assured destruction for security. Most people had forgotten this atomic threat until President Barack Obama in a 2009 speech delivered in Prague revived the old dream of the world free of atomic bombs and started new disarmament 
2017, Donald Trump uh, threatened North Korea with uh, fury and fire with atomic bombs. Then many of us became aware and gained of this destiny, hanging like a dark cloud over the nations. Strangely enough, we feel the presence of the nuclear threat publicly in what American psychologists call nuclear numbing. We repress our anxiety, try to forget this threat and live if is this, this danger were not there. Yet it is gnawing on at our some consciousness in impairing our love of life. Number four, the social conditions of misery. A general impairment of life also exists in the miserable social conditions. For more than 40 years, we have heard repeatedly and everywhere the charge that despite of all political efforts, the social gap between the rich and the poor is widening. It is not just in the poor countries of the third world that a small rich sector of the population rules over the masses of the poor. In the democracies of the developed world, the financial asset gap between, between financiers on the one hand and low-income worker welfare recipients, the unemployed and those not able to work on the other hand, takes on obscene proportions. Yet democracy is granted not only in the freedom of the citizens, but also in the equality. Without social justice in life opportunities in the comparability of life circumstances, the common wheel dies and with it what holds a society together falls apart. Trust is lost. Since the democratic revolutions in England, the United States and France, the political task in the European states has been the balancing of individual freedom and social equity. The deregulation of the economy and fiscal institutions wrought by American politics with all its destructive consequences has led to an imbalance between freedom and equality. 
that has become life-threatening for many people is that led to the disempowerment in poverty. A capitalism is, that is no longer politically controllable through the commonwealth becomes an enemy of democracy because it destroys the common meaning of a society. Climbing on the social ladder brings anxiety. In the modern competitive society, the loser falls off and the winner The anxiety of life creates nothing, but the anxiety of existence for modern human being. Yet is anxiety a good incentive for life, for work, and for happiness? I doubt. Uh, at the end, uh, the ecological conditions of world destruction. Unlike the nuclear threat, climate change is not only a threat, but already an emerging reality everywhere. It is not only a latent problem, but also very much a matter of public consciousness. People know it because they can see it, feel it, and sometimes smell it. The biosphere of the planet Earth is the only space we have for life. The globalization of the human civilization has reached its limits and is beginning to alter the conditions of life on Earth. The destruction of the environment that we are causing through our present global economic system will undoubtedly seriously jeopardize the survival of humanity in the 21st century. Modern interest industrial society is thrown out of the balance, the equilibrium of the earth organism and is on the way to the universal ecological death unless we can change the way things are developing. Year after year, vulnerable species of animals and plants die out. Scientists have shown that certainly that certain chemical emissions are destroying the ozone layer while the use of chemical fertilizers and a multitude of pesticides uh, is polluting our drinking water and making the soil infertile. They have shown that the global climate is already changing. 
so, so that we are now experiencing an increasing number of so-called natural catastrophes, such as droughts and floods, expanding deserts and intensive uh, storms, catastrophes that are not simply natural but also caused by human activities. All in all, life on Earth is under threat. Why is this so? With some irony, I may say, some do not know what they are doing, uh, while others do not do what they are knowing. This ecological crisis it is fundamentally a crisis wrought by the Western scientific and technological civilization. Yet it is a mistake to think that environmental problems are problems for the industrialized countries of the world. On the contrary, ecological customs are even more in the midst of a radical economic and social problems in the development. Indira Gandhi was right when she said poverty is the worst pollution. Despite the well-known documented of limits of the growth, the ideology of permanent growth continues. We know all this, but we are paralyzed and do not change our economy or our lifestyle. This paralysis will be called ecological numbing. Nothing accelerates an imminent catastrophe so much as a paralysis of doing nothing. We do not know whether humanity will survive this self-made destiny. This is actually a good thing. If we knew with certainty that we would not survive, we would do nothing. If we knew with the certainty that we will survive, we would also do nothing. Only if the future is open for both possibilities are we forced to do today what is necessary to survive tomorrow. We cannot know whether the humankind will survive, so we must act today as if the future of life depends on us and trust at the same time that our children and will survive. But must a human race exist and survive, or are we just an accident of nature? We can ask cynically, 
didn't see dinosaurs come and go. So it ends with a question of existence, whether humanity should be or not be. That is a Hamlet question of our days. More than eight billion human beings already live on Earth today. This number will likely grow rapidly. An alternative for your future is that the Earth could be in uninhabited. The Earth existed without human beings for more than uh, millions of years and may survive perhaps for millions of years after the human race disappears. This raises the even deeper question, are we human beings on Earth only by chance, or are we human beings a necessary result of the evolution? If nature would show a strong anthropic principle we could feel at home in the universe with Stuart Kaufman. If such a stark anthropological principle cannot be proved, the universe gives no answer to this existential question of your mankind. Looking to the universe for an answer uh, to the question of a uh, uh, reason for being, we encounter the sad conjecture of Steven Weinberg. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. The silence of the world's expenses and the coldness of the universe can lead to our despondence. In any case, neither the stars nor our genes say whether human beings should be there or not. How can we love life and affirm our being as humans if humanity is only an accident of nature, superfluous and without relevance for the universe? But it's only a mistake of the evolution. Is there a duty to be, as Hans Jonas claimed? Is there any reason to love life and affirm human beings if we find no answer to this? is the essential question every culture of life is uncertain in its fundamentals and built on shaky grounds. With this, I start part two. A culture of life must be a culture of common life in the human and the natural world. First point, can we live with a bomb? 
other dangers growing faster, then we can, uh, what can save us? I think we can grow in wisdom. But how? President Obama's dream of a world without atomic weapons is an honorable one, but only a dream. Human beings will never again become incapable of what they can do now. Whoever is, has learned the formula of atomic fission will never forget since Hiroshima in 1945, humankind has lost its atomic innocence. Yet, the atomic end time is also the first common age of the nations. All the nations are sitting in the same boat. We all share the same threat. Everyone become, can, can become the victim. In this new situation, humankind must organize itself as the subject of common survival. The foundation of the United Nations in 1945 was a first step. International security partnership can serve peace and give us time to live. And someday, perhaps a transnational unification of humankind will keep the means of nuclear destruction under control. By science and technology, we learned to gain power over nature. But by wisdom, we learn to gain moral control of our powers. The, the development of public and political wisdom is, is as important as the scientific progress. The first lesson we learn is this. Deterrence that does not secure peace anymore. Only justice serves peace between the nations. There is no way to peace in our world except through just action and harmonious balance of interests. Peace is not the absence of violence, but the, the presence of justice. Peace is a process or not a property of one nation. Peace is a common way of reducing violence and constructing justice in the social and global relationships of humankind. Point two, social justice creates social peace. The gap between the poor and the rich widens, but the alternative to poverty is not poverty. The alternative 
to poverty and property is community. One can live in a poverty when it is born in a common with others, as was the case in Europe in the years of hunger after the World War II. It is injustice that makes poverty insufferable. The spirit of communal solidarity and mutual help was demolished by the flight from Texas, which in turn arouses the angel of the people. If if everyone is in the same situation, then all give mutual help. Remove equality because one wins and the other loses, then mutual help also vanishes. By community, I here mean the visible community of solidarity as well as the inner togetherness of society in social balance and social freedom. It is not in the end the football games that unite a society. It is social justice that creates last, lasting social peace. The individualism that says uh, everyone is 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 oh, her own neighbor, looking out out for himself and herself, makes the human beings powerless. The fragmenting of work by making it temporary, insecure, and without benefits harms the life planning of those at the mercy of the system and destroys their future. In communities of solidarity, Human beings are strong and wealthy. That is, wealthy in relationships with neighbors and friends, companions and colleagues on which one can depend. They they are thus made strong by being recognized and by being esteemed as worthy. Many helpful actions emerge in such communities, such as child care, care of the sick, and care of the aged, associations of the handicapped, and the hospice movement. Market position and competition are certainly strong incentives for work, but they remain humane only in the framework of a common life, and that means only in the bounds of social and ecological justice. There are dimensions of life that may not be determined by the market logic because they follow other 
laws. Patients are not customers of doctors and nurses, and students are not consumers of science and research in our universities. Security must not be a private property. And the reverence for life. Because human society and natural environment can cause a total life system where there is a crisis of dying in nature, a crisis of the whole life system emerges as well. What we call today the ecological crisis is not only a crisis in our environment, but also a total crisis of our life system and cannot be solved by technological means alone. It also demands a change in our lifestyle and a change in the basic values and convictions of our society. Modern industrial societies are no longer in harmony with the cycles and rhythms of the earth, as was the case in pre-modern agrarian societies. Modern societies are predicated on progress and expansion of the projects of humanity. We reduce the nature of the earth to our environment and destroy the life space of other forms of life. Nothing works so much destruction as reducing nature to more than an environment for humans. We need a change from modern domination of nature to the reverence for life, as Albert Schweitzer teaches us. Reverence for life is respect for every single form of life and for our common life in the human and in the natural world and for the great community of all the living. The postmodern life centrism will have to replace the Western and modern anthropocentrism of culture. Of course, we cannot return to the cosmos orientation of the ancient and pre-modern agrarian world. What we can the, begin the necessary ecological transformation of our industrial world. For this, we must change our concept of time. The linear concept of progress in production, consumption and waste as the future, the present and the past must give way to the concept 
of the cyclical time of renewable build energy and a recycling economy. Only the cycles of life can give stability to our world of progress. Yet as long as the children of Ghana bear the burden of recycling our electronic scrap, we must say the recycling economy is still the economy of the poor people. In the, the 2000 S Charter points in the right direction. Humanity is part of nature. All other life forms of nature have their worth independent of their worth for human beings. We are part of nature and can say only survive by, by preserving nature's integrity. The last part, the love of life in times of danger. Human being is not only a gift of life, but also a task of being human. To accept this task of humanity in times of terror requires the strength of life and the courage to be. Life must be found against terror. To say it simply, my life must be lived, and then the beloved life will be stronger than the threat of universal annihilation. I see, see three major factors for this courage to be in this courage to live. First, human life must be affirmed because it can also be denied. As we know, a child, a child can only grow and live in an atmosphere of affirmation in an atmosphere of rejection, the child will fade away in soul and body. If experiencing affirmation is the occasion for a child to affirm himself or herself. What is true for a child is true for human beings throughout their lives. We, we are accepted, appreciated, and affirmed. We are motivated to live where we feel a hostile world of contempt and rejection and mistrust if we retire into ourselves and become defensive. We need a strong affirmation of life that can deal with such uh, negations of life. Each yes to life is stronger than every negation of life because it can create something new against 
the negations. Second, human life is participation. We become alive where we feel the sympathy of others and we stay alive where we share our life with others. As long as we are interested, we are alive. The counterproof can easy to make. Indifference leads to apathy, and apathy is a sickness unto death. Complete lack of participation is completely unlived life. Third, human life is a life in the pursuit of fulfillment. Human life gains its dynamic from this inborn striving the pursuit of happiness is since the writing of the Declaration of Independence of America one essential human right to pursue one's happiness is not only a private human right but also a public human right. We speak of a good life and we mean a life that lives out its best potential in the public life of a good society. When we take this pursuit of happiness seriously, we encounter the misfortune of the masses of poor and sick people and to begin to suffer with the unfortunate. The compassion by which we are drawn into their passion of life is the reverse side of the pursuit of happiness. The more we become capable of the happiness of life, the more, the more we can become also capable of sorrow and compassion. This is the great dialectic of human life. But where there is danger, salvation also grows. How is salvation growing? I've tried to show how being can take in non-being and how life can overcome death through love and how deadly contradictions can change into productive differences and higher forms of living and community. Near is God and difficult to grasp. Here at the end I will allow the theologian in me to speak with declarations of Christian faith. Should humanity be or are we superfluous? Is there a duty to survive or our life and death simply a take or leave? it matter. In the evolution of life are we an accident or a, or a mistake of life? 
the existential questions of humankind are not only answered by rational arguments, but first of all by pre-rational assurance or a lack of assurance that leads the interest of our reason. Difficult to grasp is God, not because God is distant from us human beings, but rather near and therefore disabled, difficult to grasp. What is near, indeed nearer to us than we ourselves, is not to be grasped by us, we, for we would need distance for that. If we were, however, grasped by the nearness of God, we would know the answer of, to our existential questions. In the eternal years of the living God, we affirm our fragile and vulnerable humanity in spite of death and say yes to life. In the eternal love of God, we love life and resist its devastations. In the ungraspable nearness of God, we trust in what is saving even if dangers are growing. Here ends the lecture.